Hey guys, it's your midsole man, Ed Budd here. I've lost track of the number of requests from viewers for some more comparisons against the Hoka Mac X2. A real banger, this one. I'm lining it up against a load of other shoes today. First up, the Adidas Boston 12, the SC Trainer 3 from New Balance, the Super Blast 2 from Asics, and the Hyperion Max 2 from Brooks. Super Trainers in plentiful supply in 2024, but which one comes out on top? Let's find out. Thanks for tuning in people, it is always appreciated. Help to increase the subscriber base by clicking that button if you've not done so already. Also give this video a thumbs up, like, and comment as well to help fight the YouTube algorithm. Dank, 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 sure. Aside from the Super Blast 2 from Asics and also the Brooks Hyperion Max 2, all of the other shoes I've bought with my own Earth credits. So those brands are not paying me to make this video and they won't get to vet my views before my valued viewers get to see them. Most of the trainers here, all around a sort of 7 to 5 mil drop. The Mac X and the Super Blast 2 are a little bit taller in the midsole stack with 47 mil in my size. Remember, larger sizes bigger shoes okay the SC trainer 3 easy the most expensive here for some crazy reason in the UK New Balance have got this big hike on the price it's quite out of the stratosphere really super blast 2 easy the widest in the forefoot here and the SC trainer 3 is close in terms of midsole surface area all the shoes within about 30 grams of each other the SC trainer 3 and the Brooks Hyperion Max 2 the heaviest Though, in fairness, they're all pretty light for what you actually get. First up, the Mac X2 against the Boston 12 from Adidas. So you've got rods versus a P-back plate here in the Hoka shoe. And a combo of foams with a larger amount of that softer foam under the forefoot. And then a build-up of a slightly firmer more resilient foam in the heel. I have to say grip is absolutely fantastic on both models. There's a perhaps slightly more traditional lockdown over the top of the foot in the Hoka. So what's the difference here? I would suggest the Hoka feels a little bit faster. It's just a little bit lighter than the Boston 12. It's about half an ounce of weight difference between the two and I think that's what accounts for it. The two areas of the shoe that do feel different are certainly back here in the heel. The amount of stack that you've got is just increased in the Hoka and you do feel it over some longer miles. And we've got a lower weight, a little bit more underfoot cushion here across the footbed. Just feels a little bit more compressive out of the box where you've got to work at the Boston 12 a little bit to get the best out of it. I found I needed like 50 to 60 kilometers before the whole thing really softened up. And you might not want to do that with your brand new shoe. You might just want to get it on foot and really enjoy it right from the off. As such, I think the Hoka is going to appeal to a few more people. I think it's a little bit more versatile, just feels a little bit less present, I suppose, over the top of the foot. The Boston 12 had quite a unique, very characterful sort of lacing system with those lace loops across both sides. You've also got a little bit more heel width here in the Mac X2. I'd say it's easily as stable as the Boston 12 with a little bit more compression there due to the slightly lower durometer foam. As such, if I think I had to have one, it would certainly be the Hoka out of the two. I think it's worth the extra 30 quid for what you get. The Boston 12 is still a banging shoe for the money, but I think this one's just got the edge over it. Next up against the SC Trainer 3 from New Balance. I just can't understand why New Balance think it's okay to hike the price on this and expect to sell pairs of these here in the UK. It's a huge price, £230 for a training shoe really. I mean it's very soft and compressive but it's almost an ounce heavier than Hoka's model. And the 60 quid increase doesn't really equate to performance either. For me the Hoka just feels better at a range of paces. This one locked in nicely to half marathon or marathon pace, but with the ankle collar irritating the sort of ball section of my ankle a little bit. I mean, I had to use specific socks to make the shoe work, which is kind of off-putting really to me. I often think while I'm out there using it, is that going to happen again? Is that nagging issue back there? I've not had any issues in the upper on the Mac X2 so far. Now, we do have a carbon plate here in the SC Trainer 3. That did seem to stabilise the fuel cell foam really well across the bottom of the foot. And it's easily the most compressive of all materials in today's video. What I'm finding with many of these super trainers is 
you could quite easily make them into a race shoe with a couple of changes a little bit less rubber on the outsole slightly less of these beefed up materials here in the upper the sc trainer is one of those shoes that's very much in that category almost makes it feel like it's just worth paying the extra money and getting the race version it's just simply a shoe that i can't really recommend you pick up it's just too expensive maybe if you can find a cheaper discount deal on it then have a go and see what you think but for most people for a daily trainer i think the rebel 4 will probably suffice if you can find it in a narrow fit perhaps that shoe is very voluminous as such i'm just finding the mac x2 a lot more usable a lot more exciting it's just more consistent and stable as well it feels like a nice smooth ride there's even a higher stack of foam in this shoe bizarrely a sleeker design especially around the ankle collar i mean it's so much cheaper as well versus this shoe i think at the retail price this one's 170 and these are about 230 i didn't pay 170 either i think it was about 135 something like that it's easily worth that so probably one of the worst pickups of the year so far the sc trainer 3 just feel there's better fitting shoes out there for way less cash next up the shoe tubers delight the super blast 3 from asics people are going absolutely haywire about this shoe i do think it's a darn good model i have to say though it's just too hard to try and buy it there's a few sizes available in a new minty sort of colorway up on the asics website right now but none of the bigger men's pairs there again this shoe grows with you over time it does change its characteristics over the first sort of 50 or 60 miles the compression gets a bit better feels a bit less hollow a little bit more squashy it does feel a little bit like this is in a specific category though with that huge width underfoot i think it's a good choice for perhaps distance training it certainly doesn't really feel like a shoe that i want to run particularly fast in it's very absorbent feels great actually on some easier or recovery type runs but for me it doesn't really feel like a race shoe more like a tool for training very close in terms of weight though the hoka on foot feels a lot lighter there's a lot less shoe and i just feel it's got a little edge in terms of its propulsive feel similar drop between the two though significantly more surface area in the forefoot and the heel over the mac x2 i think perhaps if you're a heavier built runner you might get a little bit more out of the super blast 2 with that width in the forefoot those of you that have perhaps experienced flight foam turbo plus in the metaspeed sky paris won't get exactly the same feel out of this shoe it is responsive i suppose especially when you consider some of the other top tier foams from the other brands and manufacturers i think that's half the problem with this shoe really it's picked up a lot of hype it is very good yes do you need to comment about the rigidity as well the super blast 2 that mainly comes from the foam there's quite a lot of it and it doesn't flex all that much but i think if you're looking for something that's fast and pacey that you can run practically any distance in and the Mac X2 really hits the spot. I hope it's a bit softer, it's a little bit more flexible, it's compressive, it's certainly lighter. I think that propulsive feel was down to that Piba plate that we have here within the midsole and the positioning of it and the drop just make for a really smooth shoe that picks up the pace, goes through the gears very nicely. Grip's actually pretty good on both shoes now. I think both brands have actually improved the grip on some of their top tier shoes over the last year or so. The ridges and the rubber sections here are a little bit deeper than before. A lot more sticky rubber here on the Mac X2. So I think if you want significant cushion and less sort of reliance on use in the five to 10K range, then the Super Blast 2 is perhaps the better choice of the two, if you can find it, of course. I think the Mac X2 came with not much of a fanfare actually, with a few reviewers commenting that they received rubbing here i think it's got to be down to sizing i've experienced none of that whatsoever and there's a load of viewers out there that have picked up the shoe and haven't had issue either 30 quid cheaper than the super blast 2 maybe you can get the price down even lower with a little discount that would be my pick if you're tired of waiting for the super blast 2 one last comparison, this time the Mac X2 up against the Hyperion Max 2 from Brooks. Certainly a little bit more padding and a little bit more rigidity back here in the heel. And the foam, when you get it in hand and get it on foot, is that bit more responsive. It's a little bit firmer, more rubbery sort of feel. Similar widths up front in both shoes, though the Mac X2 has got a little bit extra here in the heel. It depends how you like your shoes really. If you want that sort of responsive firmer squash then the Hyperion Max 2 is the way forward. If you like things a little bit softer 
slightly more smooth than I think the Mac X2 could do the business. I do like the upper on both shoes here, really nice fitting kind of feel across the top of the foot. Found it easy to get a good lockdown in both of them. We do have plates in both midsoles here and as such we've got a nice propulsive feel from both models. Hyperion Max 2 coming in slightly lower than the Mac X2 by a tenner, though I'm sure you can find some discount on there if you want to bring it down some more. Stability in both shoes, very 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 good considering the stack talking of stack there is a little bit extra here in the heel over the brooks model and certainly up front as well as a few millimeters extra in the mac x if anything i feel the brooks shoe is slightly more stabilized over the full footbed looks wise i think the brooks hyperion max takes it just by a hair. Grip on both shoes, very, very good, especially on cornering. Did get to try this one out in wet weather and it performed very, very well. It's like all the brands have upped their game a little bit in terms of outsole rubber. I think with Puma and Adidas having the lion's share of that a few years ago, everybody else has decided that they need to really sort out the outsoles. Very close between these two, do like them very much. I think though I'd probably opt for the Hoka, it's just a little bit lighter than the Hyperion Max 2, a little bit more forgiving underfoot. Okay, that's all the comparisons for today. I hope that's answered a few questions there that the viewers had. Uh, never before have I received so many requests for a comparison video against lots of different shoes. Let me know your thoughts and opinions on all the shoes in today's video down in the comments. Very quick musical interlude for you. I've been digging back into the Neil Young Archive Volume 2. I know Volume 3 is just released, but there's so much here it takes ages to get through it. I really like the album Time Fades Away by Neil Young but I think he was always a little bit upset about the audio quality and certainly some of the performances on that record. As such he's included a load of extra live performances with different band members from the same tour and these certainly seem to be more in line with what Neil Young wanted from the songs that kind of feel it's like the sort of old boy country rock and roll fun and you can tell he's having more fun he's kind of playing with the lyrics a little bit the guitar solos sound like he actually wants to play a guitar solo overall the bands sound a bit looser I suppose but it's just a lot more exciting and energetic it's pretty much the case for the other live tracks from this period as well on the archive to i suggest you check them out brilliant little capture of the sound and the feel of neil young at that time the time fades away outtakes from the neil young archive too thanks for tuning in people hope you enjoyed today's comparison video hit that subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up like also drop us a comment to help fight the algorithm and a super thanks as well to help support the channel on a more ad hoc basis my name's ed bud and i'll be seeing you